Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. It's Gofani Lungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. For the other things that we do, you can go to the description, like our second YouTube channel our podcast patreon and you can find the links in the description box below i hope you guys are doing all right and may you stay blessed and a big shout out to the person that suggested this today we're going to be reacting to how muhammad received his first revelation so without wasting time let's get into the video and when he reached the age of 38 39 the Prophet ﷺ had a very interesting experience. He started to see dreams at night. He started to have dreams at night. And what would happen is the next day, the dream would come true. Like whatever he saw in his dream would occur in the next day. And then, so the first time you're like, okay. Then the second time, third time, fourth time, and it became a daily event. So much so that he just expected it. And that was to get him to just kind of trust his heart. To be comfortable with having knowledge, with being given knowledge that was not available, was not possible to be attained anywhere else. And once that started to happen, then he really started to reflect and deep think, uh, very, you know, think very deeply. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ decided I need to kind of get some time away. I need some time to reflect. I need some time to just invest into just some deep thought, deep reflection. Get away from the noise. And that's when he tells his wife, and he's been telling her, I have these dreams, and whatever I see comes true the next day. And she tells him, don't worry, just trust your heart. Everything has a purpose and a reason. Then he comes to her and tells her, I need some time to reflect, to think. I need to get away for a little bit. And she says, absolutely. How long do you need to go for? At least a couple of days. I'm going to go find a nice spot in the mountains, not too far away. But I need a secluded, nice spot where I can go and I can reflect. She packs him together some food, some supplies, some clothes, and sends him off very lovingly. And the Prophet ﷺ goes outside of Mecca, finds a mountain by the name of Nur, Jabal Nur. And there he finds a small cave by the name of Hira, Ghar Hira. And he actually chose that spot because when he sat at the mouth of the cave, he could see the Kaaba from there. And he sits down and he begins to meditate and reflect and pray and think over here. And he would be gone for a few days at a time and he would come back down and go back home, spend a few weeks at home, a month or so at home, then pack up some stuff and then go again. And this way he would kind of come and go, take a few days here and there. One time it mentions that he was gone and Khadija helped him pack the stuff that he was taking. So she knew exactly how much food he had. And when they go, when he goes, she realizes that he's been gone longer than what he had food for. So she packs some food and some supplies together and she actually goes outside of Mecca and climbs up the mountain and the Prophet is sitting at the opening of the cave and he sees her and he says, what are you doing here? And she says, I got worried about you. I want to make sure that you were okay. I brought some food for you. So this is what their relationship was like, one of understanding and facilitating and providing and accommodating one another. So we know of that blessed day when the Prophet ﷺ receives divine revelation. And so now the Prophet ﷺ comes back down from the cave. And he comes home. And he's shaking and trembling, overwhelmed by this profound experience. Unlike anything any a human being has ever experienced. There, has been, there have been many a messenger and prophet before him, but he just received the Qur'an. Most powerful experience any human being's ever had. So he's overwhelmed, shaking and trembling. And the Prophet ﷺ was a seeker of knowledge. He was a seeker of knowledge. Why was he up in the cave? What was he trying to do in the cave? He was trying to know reality. He wanted to know reality. And the Prophet ﷺ, what is the first commandment that he's given? 
once that reality addresses him. Read in the name of your Lord. And then tells him that he's the one that Allama bil qala Allama al insana ma lam ya'lam. He taught with the pen and he taught the human being what he didn't know. So at the very beginning of the revelation is read in the name of your Lord. Read. Who taught with the pen, he taught with the pen and he taught man what he didn't know. So he's overwhelmed, shaking and trembling. And he comes home and he tells his beloved wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, Dathiruni, Dathiruni. Zammiluni, Zammiluni. Cover me. Wrap me up in a blanket, in a shawl. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha wraps him up and covers him up. And then she asks him that, tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. And the Prophet ﷺ tells her the entire experience. That this angel, he came to me. And he said the following words to me. And he recites the Qur'an to her. And tells him of the divine responsibility that has been placed on his shoulder. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, now we see what marriage, what it really culminates in. She sits down next to him. She takes his hand. She looks him in the eyes. And this is what she says to him. This is how she defines 15 years of marriage. Six children later. The death of two of those children. Everything they've been through. Listen to what she has to say. This is her summary of her husband. This is how she explains and defines him. She says, Kalla wallahi. She says, absolutely nothing to worry about. I swear to God. La yukhzika Allahu abadan. God will never ruin you. He will never abandon you. Why am I so confident in saying this? What do I know about you? After 15 years of sharing morning and evening, day and night, after sharing a life with you, what can I say about you? Innaka la tasilur rahim. Innaka la tasilur rahim. You're a good family man. You take care of your family. You love your family. Wa tuqri wa taqri al you honor your guest. You look for people who are overlooked and neglected and downtrodden by society. And you go and you grab them by the hand and lift them back up. You go and give to those people who can't, you take care of those people who can't take care of themselves. You look for those people. And you are always the first one waiting there whenever there's a good cause. There's no way that God would ever abandon you, that God would ever forsake you. I refuse to believe it. And then the Prophet ﷺ tells her, that's fine, but who will believe this message? And she says, I believe this message. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka rasulullah. And then she even helps him. However she can, whatever she knows. She takes him to her cousin, Waraqa bin Nofal. She said, he knows. He talks about this type of stuff. He talks about prophets and revelation and angels and God and divine inspiration. He talks about this stuff. I'll do what I can. And she takes the Prophet ﷺ to her cousin and introduces them. And the Prophet ﷺ talks to Waraqa bin Nofal and he says, you are the Prophet. I wish... I could be there when your people will oppose you. I would help you and I would aid you and I would support you. And I would stand by your side if that day would come. Now what happens at this particular point in juncture? Something very, very beautiful. And so Jibreel, the angel Gabriel, Jibreel comes to the Prophet 
takes him with him, strikes the earth, a spring comes forth from the earth and he says, this is from the well of Zamzam. This is an offshoot, a branch of the well of Zamzam being provided for you here. So that, and then he shows him wudu. Jibreel alayhisam shows the Prophet sallallahu wudu. And then the Prophet sallallahu makes wudu. And then Jibreel stands up and shows him how to pray two rakahs. This is before the five times daily prayer. Just how to pray two rakahs. So that he can talk to Allah and pray when he needs it. Whenever any situation came up, he would immediately go to his prayer. Guess what the Prophet ﷺ does? With this new salah, this wudu, this purification and this prayer that he just learned, he rushes back home to his beloved wife. The first believer, his strongest supporter, his rock. He goes home to her and he grabs her by the hand and he says, Come on, I have to share something with you. I have to show you something amazing. And he takes her there and they make wudu together. And then he stands up with her and he says, now follow after me. And he shows her how to pray and they pray together. And so now what happens? Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and the Prophet had money, had wealth. And they realized that many poor people in Mecca, slaves in Mecca are accepting Islam. And they start spending their money. The Prophet ﷺ can't take out time anymore to go on business trips and go and make more money. He's got to preach, he's got to teach, he's got to spread the message far and wide. And Khadija every single morning wakes up and is standing there with him at the door, telling him, go out there and spread this message far and wide. And on top of that, on the other side, while he can't go out and do business anymore, there are constantly slaves who need freeing who've become Muslim and are being tortured because they're Muslim. So they need to be freed. So they're spending their own money freeing these slaves, feeding the poor, looking after people, sending people off to Habasha, to East Africa, to escape persecution, to go and live there in freedom and in safety. They spend their money in sending these people off, making sure they're okay. Finally, the time comes where eventually a lot happens during this time. Over the next six, seven years, a lot happens. And they finally, the Meccans, the Quraysh, the opposition to the message of the Prophet ﷺ, they decide that the only way to really handle and curb this issue is to boycott Muhammad, his family and his followers and his supporters. Kick them out from Mecca and isolate them and boycott them. So Abu Talib rounds up the clan. All the believers, all the followers, all the supporters, including the Prophet ﷺ, his beloved wife Khadija, and their children. And they go into the Shi'ab of Abu Talib. A place, some property, some land Abu Talib had outside of Mecca. And they are isolated there for three years. Nobody will do business with them. Nobody will trade with them. Nobody will lend them any money. Nobody will provide them any food. Nobody will deal with them in any way, shape or form. Nobody will show them any kindness. And they spent three years like this. Days would go by where people wouldn't have food to eat and water to drink. Babies would cry because they were hungry and their mothers would cry because they hadn't eaten anything to be able to nurse their babies. Children died, babies died. There were graves of babies and children. Many, many people died during this time. Dozens of graves were dug during this time. The cries and the screams of women crying over the passing of babies and children could be heard all the way into Mecca. People became sick, malnourished, very, very ill. Until finally, through again the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, miraculous means the boycott was lifted and everybody came back into Mecca. And it said that during this time Khadija, who was a lot older now, she, came, she became very sick and very ill. And they came back from this boycott in the Shia of Abi Talib and she passed away a few months later. And that harshness of those three years, not just the physical harness, harshness, but the emotional difficulty, Watching these people struggle, caring for them, loving them. She was like a mother to all of them. 
Her heart just couldn't bear it. And a couple of months later, she was bedridden for a few months. And the Prophet ﷺ was so distraught this entire time. Until finally one day she breathed her last and she passed away. There are narrations which talk about the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was so devastated. He's a single father. Two of his daughters are not married. Fatima was quite young. She's a young girl. She was maybe 8, 10, 12 years old. And he was so devastated at the loss of his beloved wife Khadija. He actually didn't come out of his home. Just sat at home with his daughter recovering. Mourning. Healing. For a few days, he was not seen outside. Uh, when Khadija passed away, uh, one of the Sahaba says, we did not see him smile for months. We did not see him smile for months. And it was such a, a big loss for the Prophet Muhammad. And when his family members came to see him, you could see the, 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 the streaks of tears on his face. Hugging his daughter sitting there, trying to console his daughter at the loss of her mother. And so yes, the Prophet ﷺ did eventually get remarried. A couple of years later. And yes, the Prophet ﷺ eventually left Mecca and migrated to Medina. And yes, eventually he established the most beautiful community this earth has ever seen. And yes, when eventually he had grandchildren and laughed again and smiled again and had a beautiful experience and happiness and joy in his life. But you know something very interesting? He never forgot Khadija. Never forgot Khadija. Never. This was a very interesting video. I've actually reacted to the contents of this video under the title, um, I think, Life of Muhammad. But this time around, what they were talking about, the, it's the same message, only that the title of this video is the revelation of whatever took place. Otherwise, it's a good reminder, other than just stuff being reviewed here were being taught Khadija from the way go was a very very supportive woman a very very great woman just like any other woman that's out there all women are great and she was a very good support system to the husband uh, even when he was scared when he didn't know how people would take the message other than that um Muhammad, she reminded Muhammad that he wouldn't be alone she would believe the message and that God would always be by our side, no matter what the situation is. So let's not be frightened by taking the next, the, the, the next big step in our lives. God will always be there for us, no matter what. Otherwise, this was very, very interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. And I'll see you in my next reaction video.